All right. All eyes were on France this Sunday as the public went out to vote in their presidential election. An election that was won by Emmanuel Macron. A decisive victory over Marie Le Pen. And you could almost feel the sigh of relief spreading across Europe and the United States, at least among certain individuals when that took place. Uh, because many thought that France was going to be the next country that would be overwhelmed by this wave of nationalism, populism, and anti-globalization. And it didn't happen. And instead, Macron won on a, on a platform, on a campaign of openness and tolerance. He was pro-European Union. He was pro-free trade. He embraced globalization. He embraced immigration. When he took the stage Sunday night after his victory, he didn't walk out to the French national anthem. He walked out to Beethoven's Ode to Joy. I got a little. All right, just a little more. All right, this is important for a couple reasons. One. Beethoven is always the right choice for a party. Uh, secondly, Ode to Joy is a national anthem for the European Union. And so when he makes this choice, we see that this is indeed a victory for the European Union. It's a victory for economic and political integration. At a deeper and a broader level, it's a victory for liberalism in this broad, deep sense. Now, Marie Le Pen ran a campaign that was targeting and attacking those very same principles. A targeting, targeting liberalism, targeting integration, targeting free trade, targeting globalization. And if we think about it, the Marie Le Pens of the world have had a pretty good run. If we think about this as a baseball game, uh, if, if, you know, the populist politics, liberalism was really down to its last strike. <laughs> strike one, the Brexit, when Great Britain left the European Union. Strike two. Donald Trump, right, populist campaign. So here we have France sitting down 0-2 in the account, 0-2 in the account. What do they do? France homers the deep center, right? Uh, there's, there's Macron hitting his home run. Uh, and it's important that we appreciate the significance of this victory. Because if Le Pen had won, she had vowed to pull France out of the European Union. And if France had pulled out of the European Union, it was likely that the European Union would have collapsed. She'd also talked about pulling out of NATO, so this transatlantic alliance may have gone away. I mean, this would have been a fundamental shift in the world that we live in. We would have gotten up Monday morning and lived in a world where nationalism, anti-globalization, xenophobia had won another victory. So this was important, and it's something that I think is worth celebrating. So the question is, how did we get here? How did this all happen? So what I want to do over the next 10, 12 minutes is to walk you through the French election and try to put it in a little bit bigger, broader context. Because I think what we've just seen is arguably the most thrilling, terrifying, and consequential election in French history. It's a big deal. All right, so let's go back and let's start from the beginning. The way France does its elections, it's two rounds. So the first round occurred on April 23rd, and 11 candidates ran for president. Out of that first round, two candidates move, oops, move on to the finals. And that was obviously uh, Macron and Le Pen. And I know what you want me to do. You want me to go and start talking about the finalists. I'm not going to do that. Because I think the first round and the candidates in the first round might be more exciting than what we saw in the second round. And I think if we want to understand populism in the international system right now, the dynamics that played out in the first round are really, really important. All right, so let's start with the current president of France, uh, Francois Hollande, who didn't even run. So uh, politics 101, if you are an incumbent, there are certain advantages that you have, right? Incumbents always run, and they've got a good chance of winning. So why doesn't Hollande run? Well, let's take a look at his approval ratings. <laughs> Four. Four. I didn't even think that was possible. All right, let's put this in some context. Donald Trump is 100 days into his administration, and he is the least popular president in the history of our democracy at the 100-day mark. Donald Trump is still at 41%, 42%. So you've got, you've got Olan going. He's looking at this in 41%. What is, your, what, is your, what is your secret, Donald, right? I'm, I'm barely cracking five. All right, so, so as you look at this situation, 
Hollande is the representative of the Socialist Party. In France, there are two main parties. The Socialist Party is the center-left party, and the Republicans are the center-right party. A lot of similarities to the United States political system. So he realizes, there's no way I can run. I can't win an election. we got to find somebody else. So what they do is they find another candidate, uh, this guy, uh, Benoit Hamon, uh, and they say, well, you should run for the party. And he wins a whopping 6.4%. And he says, thanks, Flamby. That's actually uh, Olan's nickname is Flamby, like custard. You don't want anybody calling you custard, right? <laughs> All right, so, so what happens is the Socialist Party, it's clear they're out of the way. They're not going to win the election. So this should mean that the center-right party, the Republicans, are in a wonderful position to win the presidency of France. Their candidate, Francois Fillon, Main Street conservative, a couple months ago before the first round, everybody was saying this was going to be the next president of France. In my classes, I was talking about him. We should get used to him. He's likely to be the next president. Uh, conservative, pro-free market, a very traditional conservative presence. Uh, and everything was going fine until Penelope Gate. Uh, and you got to love that the French have now taken on Gate for their controversies, right? So Penelope Gate. Penelope is his wife. And it turns out, or it's alleged, that Francois Fillon was funneling hundreds of thousands of dollars, public funds, uh, to his wife and children for jobs, public jobs that they weren't doing. You can't do that. The story breaks. Suddenly his approval levels start to go down and down and down. Uh, another thing breaks that he's been accepting gifts. You're not supposed to do this. And in particular, he accepted two suits that totaled 13,000 euros. Two suits. 13,000 euros. He didn't deny this. And in fact, he said, I'm perfectly allowed to be given a suit by a friend. It's not against the law. And I'm telling you all, all of my friends out here right now, if you want to give me a couple suits in the 13 or $14,000 range, I would absolutely accept those suits. Because uh, <laughs> you can see Muck needs a new suit, right? Uh, so what happens is slowly his support is undermined and he doesn't make it to the second round. So he wins 20%, but that leaves him out of the final two. So we've got a situation here now where the two dominant parties in France, neither party makes the final runoff. This has never happened in the Fifth Republic history. This is a big deal, and it opens all sorts of fascinating political dynamics out. Up. All right, let's look at some of these other candidates. Um, another major candidate that emerged is Jean-Luc Mélenchon, a uh, far-left candidate, anti-free market. A lot of people drew comparisons between him and Bernie Sanders, although he is even further left of Bernie Sanders. Uh, he got almost 20%. And this suggests something that what's going on in France, right? If these center parties are withering from within, it appears there's, being a, there's a push to the more extreme, both to the left and to the right. So he wins almost 20%. Doesn't make the runoff, but that was a major, major jump. Now, my favorite thing about this guy is that as his campaign starts going, he realizes when you're running a campaign, you've got to be in a lot of different spots at one time. His solution? Holograms. And yes, I have a video. So you're going to see a video here. Uh, you're going to see about 10 or 15 seconds where the, the stage is empty, and then suddenly, whoop, there's a hologram. All right. <laughs> The crowd goes wild, right? Now, all right, now, I don't know if the hologram is really the solution to a campaign or a good campaign stat uh, tactic, but I will say, just like Bernie Sanders, he had dramatic appeal among young people. And it suggests in France a push further left. I mean, he is anti free market, is at least acceptable uh, to a segment of the French society. That's important. All right, another candidate, uh, if we keep going far left, uh, Philippe Otou. This guy's my favorite. Now, he only gets 1% of the vote, but that doesn't really matter, right? Uh, he's a far left trade union, unionist, and he's a, he's a mechanic. He works for Ford. And so in the first round, they did this big debate where all the candidates show up, and he shows up basically wearing like a regular shirt. <laughs> he hasn't shaved. He didn't even comb his hair. Uh, and most importantly, at the debate, he starts attacking these more traditional candidates, who are, of course, in their $13,000 $13, suits, uh, directly attacking Le Pen, directly attacking France, France uh, Fillon, uh, about their corruption, about the way in which politics doesn't represent the average individual. A mechanic making a big ripple. And there were a lot of people who said, he won the debate. And that says something, right? That's really fascinating to see what's transpiring in France and what that might suggest for the future of American politics. All right, another guy that I like, uh, Jean Lassalle. This guy campaigned on foot. 
He also went on a 39-day hunger strike for his own constituents. I don't think there are many politicians in the United States who would be willing to do that. Um, it was kind of beloved, not, it wasn't really taken serious as a candidate. Again, my favorite thing about him was the ads that he created. Lots of weird black and white stuff, and one in particular in which he was mowing a hillside with his shirt off. <laughs> Now, uh, next time, the next political ca campaign that runs around and all the negative ads are on TV and you're like, oh man, it's too much. Think to yourself at that moment, well, at least everybody has their shirt on. Um, <laughs> all right. The craziest, most bizarre of all of them is Jacques Chaminade, uh, an open conspiracy theorist. You would ask him and he will say, yes, I'm a conspiracy theorist. Um, and again, he, he didn't even win. He got 0.18, right? So I'm not going to suggest he was significant, but you're going to find this funny. Uh, he believes in conspiracy theories and he has a plan to colonize Mars. And in an interview during the campaign, he spoke about this and read, uh, and so I've got the quote from here. Uh, Today, we don't have an actual space policy. We drag rickety obsolete objects like the old Star Wars rockets. So it works out in Star Wars with the Weird Bear and Larry Skywalker. <laughs> There's the Weird Bear. Um, if you can't get your Star Wars right, you don't deserve more than 0.18%, right? Um, all right, so here is the first round of the French presidential elections. <laughs> now, while this is entertaining, you may say to me, does this really matter, right? Is it significant? And I would say yes. Maybe not Larry Skywalker, maybe not a uh, guy mowing a hillside without a shirt, but the other candidates, what we see here is a fundamental transformation of the French political system. This pushing uh, away from the center. So the two dominant parties are no longer in control and we're seeing a shift uh, in that direction. That's, that's very, very important. And if we look at the actual final election itself between Macron and Le Pen, uh, so each of them in the first round got roughly 20%. In the second round, Emmanuel Macron wins 66% and Le Pen 34%. So this is a major victory. Now the question that is still to be answered is, were these people supporting Macron? Was he that popular? Was he that exciting? Or was this a vote against Le Pen? My guess is that a lot of people who were mobilized were voting against the plan, not necessarily for Macron, which would mean as he moves into office, his ability to govern is going to be very, very difficult. The other important thing to think about as we step back and think about these two candidates is I think it captures one of the central fault lines that is now facing democracies, especially Western liberal democracies. On one side, you have the forces, these anti-globalization, nationalistic, uh, xenophobic forces who want to close down borders, who want to limit trade, who want to inhibit uh, globalization. And on the other side, you have this more liberal international economic order, which wants to embrace international institutions, trade, globalization, all of that. It's unclear how this debate will end, but it certainly is important. Uh, and as we think about what are the implications of Macron winning and Le Pen losing, I think a couple things stand out. One, goal, uh, populism isn't inevitable. So what happens is, is we didn't see Brexit coming. We didn't see Donald Trump winning. Those caught us off guard. We were surprised by them. And I think there's a tendency when you get caught off guard to overreact and say, well, populism is hitting everywhere. But the reality is populism lost in France. It lost in Netherlands and it lost in Austria. So there are at least three cases where the wave was stopped. There was a speed bump on the way of populism. Now, even though populism isn't inevitable, I do think it's a significant factor that's here to stay for a while. And then the question is, how big of a factor is it going to be? Can it be an opposition party? Can it be a governing party? What we've seen with Le Pen, Marine Le Pen, is that she ran a sophisticated political campaign. Her father started the National Front, so her father was the one who began the party. Le Pen actually kicked her father out. He was rough, he used anti-Semitic language. He was pretty brutal and pretty rough in terms of how he ran a campaign. Le Pen got better. I think that's important as we think about these nationalist and right-wing movements. Uh, if we think about Donald Trump, Donald Trump isn't a particularly good politician. He won an election, but he's got some rough edges. This would suggest that it wouldn't be surprising in the future if we see future Donald Trumps who are a little better at politics. And I think that's an important dynamic to think about. The final thing I would suggest is that uh, the American political system might come under the same type of strain that France is dealing with. So as this election played out, the center moved away and the masses moved to the wings. Now in France that's a little bit easier because there are more parties. And so I know the political parties in the United States, those institutions are strong. But those pressures within those institutions I think are going to push 
more towards the wings. And the question is, does this party shift that way or does it hold in the center? I don't know if there's enough support to hold in the center. All right, and one final thought. I think that France is deserving of a nice glass of champagne. Uh, they've done something significant, right? Uh, they faced a populist, nationalistic, nationalist, xenophobic threat and took it down. And that's important. So congratulations to France, uh, good health to all, and thanks for coming. <laughs>